Hello, beautiful souls. You're listening to the Angels and Awakening podcast. I'm your host and author, Julie Jancis. Did you know that you can listen to this show everywhere podcasts are found? It's true. Now, I have three free gifts just for you. First gift, I give away a new reading each week to a person who's left a five-star positive review of this show, then submitted it to me using the contact form at theangelmedium.com backslash contact. I hope I'm calling your number next. Second gift, if you'd like a new daily angel message, join me on Insta at Angel Podcast. Third free gift, if you'd like to know the name of one of your guardian angels so that you can work with them even more closely, go to the homepage of my website, theangelmedium.com, and submit your contact info at the very top. I'll email you back personally with the name of one of your angels. Okay, as we begin the show, I want you to feel the presence of your angels surrounding you. And just know that the loving, positive messages you resonate with today are messages for you from your angels and loved ones on the other side. Hello, beautiful souls. Welcome back to the Angels and Awakening podcast. You're not going to believe who we have on the show today. Her new book, Nothing to Fear, Demystifying Death to Live More Fully is just amazing. And actually, you all reached out to me years ago and you said, Julie, Have you heard of this woman over on TikTok and Instagram, Hospice Nurse Julie? She's got your name. You got to go check her out. And friends, if you aren't following her, you need to be Julie McFadden, RN. She's just amazing. And she's sharing um, what it's like to be at the end of your life and how often we see others come through at the end of life. She's even got her own angel story. Welcome to the show, Julie. Thank you, Julie. We were just talking about we have the same name. Always love that. Thank yes. you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Can't uh, wait to talk. Yes. So we have to start out with this. You have a story of seeing an angel physically. And I believe that you were at the bedside of one of your patients as you saw this. So um, tell this story and then I want to kind of dissect it a little bit. Yes. Totally. Okay. So let me just preface this. So people who are listening, who are skeptical, understand that I am too. (laughs) I am, I was, and I still am even to this day, even though like what I witnessed is unexplainable, uh, which I'll get to in a second. So um, yeah, so let's just start there. This has not happened to me. I'm not like an angel girly as people would say, you know, and, and, and it still can happen is well, all I can say. So the story of the angel, I didn't tell for very long. I told the other part of the story, which I call my miracle story. And my miracle story is the one patient who I feel like came back to life uh, from uh, on a hospice anyway, I should say. I've been a nurse for a long time and different types of nurses. But my one miracle story from hospice is this woman who I admitted onto um, hospice late at night. Uh, she was young. She had young kids. And she was actively dying, which means like dying within a few hours to a few days. Now, when I saw her initially, she's my miracle story because she she came back to life. So when I saw her that night, she was like hours from death. And you get really good at this if you're used to seeing people dying and what they look like. She was not oxygenating. So she what changes in changes in her skin color, changes in her breathing. She had the death rattle. She was not maintaining, meaning she was fully unconscious, not alert and oriented, not waking up. Like I had to tell her kids right then and there, like, listen, because you could tell they did not know what was happening. They were like in their 20s. I had to get support over there for them because I thought she was dying that night, maybe even while I was still visiting. That's how close to death she was. And I'm prefacing this because this is why it's a miracle. (laughs) People don't come back from this. Truly, medically, you don't come back from what she looked like. You can't. You're breaking your brain is not getting oxygen enough to like actually come back and be a normal brain again. Anyway, I, 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 long, just to get to the angel part. <laughs> so uh, for years, I would always just talk about how, you know, she was actively dying. And right before I left, I went to her room just to make sure she was comfortable. I left her room. I left the house. The next morning, I see that 
there was no death visit or death call from the family. And I called the office being like, hey, you know, what happened to so-and-so, you know, who went to go see her? She definitely died last night. And they were like, we didn't get a call. And I thought, oh my gosh, the family, they, they must have called 911. She's probably in the hospital. I don't know what happened. So I called the family being like, hey, how'd it go? What's going on? You know, confused. And the son answered and he sounded really happy. And I could hear people laughing in the background. And I was like, what the, what the hell's going on? Right. So I'm like, what happened? You know, how'd the night go? And he was like, oh my gosh, my mom slept through the night. And she woke up and she said she's, she was really hungry and she wanted pancakes. So she's just up in the kitchen eating pancakes. And I were not thinking about it because I could not believe what they were saying. I was like, what? <laughs> They're like, yeah, she's awake and eating pancakes. And of course, like, I'm not going to like, I just sort of kept it to myself. So I was like, great. Um, can I come see you guys? Because I could not believe this. So I wanted to see for myself. Of course, there she is up eating pancakes. Um fully alert and oriented walking talking eating laughing like back from the dead like to me so that was the story I told for very so many years my miracle story my miracle story it's a miracle it's a miracle and I even told the family this is a miracle I've never seen something like this happen and um at first I thought it was the rally which is also a phenomenon that happens where like someone gets a burst of energy then dies very quickly but she didn't die she lived for another three months, fully alert and oriented and like living her best life until she did eventually die in hospice. But three months, that's a long time for a hospice patient who was actively dying. Okay, so that's my miracle story. Now the angel part of the story comes in years later when I finally got the guts to say, you know, what was I, what I actually saw that night. Wow. And because for years I didn't even... You know, I was just afraid, you know, I was afraid of not sounding credible. You know, my platform is mostly about me educating about death and dying biologically, you know, and which is still fascinating, but I'm not really, I don't really share tons of like whatever you'd call mystical stories or something. But finally I said, you know what, this deserves to be told because I'm not saying the whole truth. And the whole truth is that night before I left her, I went into her room just to truly just to check on her physically. And all of a sudden, a flash came in my head. It was in my head. So it was in my mind's eye. And an image was shown to me of this huge being uh, that basically kind of helped me see it in my mind's eye and then gave me a feeling, like communicated through feeling, which again, I can only say this in hindsight. In the moment, I was like, I didn't know what was going on in the moment. But um, so it was like this being that was huge, as big as like a twin bed. So as big as her twin bed behind the twin bed of this patient and as huge and as tall as the ceiling, if not bigger. And it felt solid, like concrete, like rock, like a solid rock thing. <laughs> it wasn't rock, but like, you know, solid is my point. And what was basically communicated with me through feeling was like this being did not care that I was there. It was okay, but it wasn't communicating with me. It was more just like, this is what it is. I'm here. I'm hers. And I've got this. And it did feel like, it didn't say like, I'm an angel, but it felt like that was what the feeling was. I'm her angel. And it didn't feel soft and warm and fuzzy. Like I thought an angel would seem like, right. It didn't feel like dainty or love. It didn't even feel loving. I wouldn't even say loving. It didn't feel scary but it just felt like power, like certainty, powerful. As it's, it's this like force of energy that was like protecting this person. And the feeling was like, she's mine. I've got her. Um, I'm watching over her right now. Um, and it wasn't even communicating with me spe specifically. It was just sort of like, that was the energy of the thing. And that's what it felt like. And it was a brief second, right? A brief second of like, it also felt like it had wings, but it was, but they were tucked behind. The way I would describe it, I don't know if anyone's Catholic, but a lot of like people, people who are Catholic have these like Mother Mary statues in their like yeah. gardens mm -hmm. and they're blue and there's like a veil and stuff. It didn't, it wasn't like that. It wasn't the Mother Mary or, or, but it felt like that kind of um, structure, like just a head, there was no facial features, broad shoulders and just like, towering over the patient and this happened like in a split second and truly 
I'm such a skeptic that I almost didn't give it a second thought. If anything, I scoffed at it when like, if anything, I was like, oh, Julie, you're, you're making this up, you know? And then I left and I did my own thing. I went to bed. I woke up the next morning and only when I saw her the next day laughing and talking with her family and living, did I know that shit, what I saw was real. And even then, Julie, I still was like, but I'm not going to tell anybody. <laughs> I'm not going to tell anyone uh, for years. I mean, for years, I probably was a good 10 years ago. And then um, finally, I just said, you know what? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not telling the, the whole truth here, you know? And I don't know. Yeah. So that's my angel story. That's my angel story. I still have a hard time explaining it because I'm so like, I don't know. Yeah. I don't understand, but that's what I, all I can tell you is what I, what I saw, you know, what they, what, what it showed me. Well, and I think that that makes the best angel story because those, you know, we never try to think our thoughts, right? The thoughts just come in. And that's been the entire premise of me having this podcast um, is to show people that our intuitive senses. And I know that there's a lot of people out there that are like the Claire's, the Claire's, you're this Claire, uh, clairvoyant, clairsentient. They all work together. We all have all of them. They just all work together. You can see them as a whole or you can dissect them one by one. But that vision that you talk about, just seeing it through your mind's eye, all of us can relate to that in that we get visions of our future. Like if you're a mama and you wanted to have those babies, you saw it within your mind's eye. It's calling to you in some way. And the angels are saying, tell, tell the mamas who are still working on bringing those babies through, hold on and have hope. Mm. Um, but you see things, you see jobs and opportunities and, and directions that you want to go. And I believe that so much of that is not us trying to think it, not even us placing it within our own senses. Mm -hmm. It's God, universe, source, all that is our angels, our guides, our loved ones on the other side, using positive, loving messages to communicate with us. Yeah. 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 It was amazing. I feel, um, I feel happy that I've been able and, and willing to like share about it and, oh, yeah. and just see what, and see what comes because, you know, I had an idea of what I thought an angel would be like, you know, and it's kind of typical. So like to have this other thing be shown to me, um, was pretty great. You know, I never told the family I said, because I was, I was also scared. So I didn't tell the family or anything, but I did, I did say to the, fam to the family that I feel, I feel like this is a miracle, but I never really shared. I never like got, I never became open with them about like, did you know you were so close to death? Do you know that, you know, I just sort of, I just sort of let them have their own experience. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't until years later that I really um, processed any of that. Friends, guess what? We're hosting two live in-person events, an in-person angel Reiki school and an in-person spiritual retreat. The first event is the weekend of June 1st in Oak Brook, Illinois, where I'm teaching the angel Reiki school. This is where you get certified in mediumship, angel messages, and energy healing all at once. For a limited time, when you register for the Angel Reiki School in person, you'll also get my eight-week online Angel Reiki School. Visit theangelmedium.com backslash get dash certified for details. You'll also find that link in the show notes. It's theangelmedium.com backslash get dash certified. The second live in-person event this year is a spiritual retreat, the weekend of October 4th in Oak Brook, Illinois. The spiritual retreat is different in that it's for your own personal growth. The spiritual retreat is all about your own personal healing, your journey, reconnecting with yourself, learning to connect with your angels. And I'm going to talk about all new angels that I've never talked about before anywhere. 
this spiritual retreat is going to leave you with more personal peace, purpose, clarity, and confidence than ever before. Learn more at theangelmedium.com backslash retreat. That's theangelmedium.com backslash retreat. So just to recap, we have the in-person spiritual retreat, October 4th, for your own personal healing and growth. And the in-person Angel Reiki School, June 1st, is where you become a medium, angel messenger, and energy healer all at once. Links to details are in the show notes. I can't wait to meet you and hug you in person. You know, I know that there's so much because I've got a lot of nurses who come through my angel Reiki school and they'll say, Julie, we can't talk about any energy healing or different things with the patients because there's boundaries. But I wonder yeah. if as, you know, society embraces this more and more people as they're passing want to talk about it. Are you allowed to talk about it with the patients if they want to talk about it with you? So if, if families, um, if families bring it up, it's such a fine line. It's such a fine line. If families bring it up, I think it's all what, what, what people are comfortable with. Right. So like if families bring it up and they are already talking about it, um, I think it's, I think it's okay, but I still always allow them to kind of guide the conversation. I'm very hesitant to say like my own beliefs, cause it's not really yeah. about my beliefs. It's about their beliefs. Right. So I'm always really, uh, I'm always really hesitant, but if they're, if they're pretty open and talking about their stuff, I, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll talk about it with them for sure. And I'll just be really careful not to interject my own thing you know, what sure. I think. Um, totally. uh, but I will say like with the visioning stuff, like the thing which we'll talk about, I'm sure uh, the part about death and dying where a lot of people vision and see dead relatives and dead uh, loved ones and pets that I do openly talk about, not about like what it means or if I believe in it, but I um, specifically educate the families about all the different phenomena that can kind of happen. Just so if it happens, they're not freaked out. You know, yeah. so I, I look at it as like an educational piece more, more versus my own personal beliefs, right? Totally. So, and then the more I do that, the more families are open to sharing with me about things that have happened to them, which is why I think I have more stories um, than I normally would have because I happen to educate about it. So then families are open with sharing. Whereas Absolutely. I think if you don't educate about it, they're not going to share because they, they're worried about sounding crazy or crazy, quote unquote crazy. I hate using that word, but just to get a point across. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I, so before we head into that part, because I do want to talk about that too, um, have you had any other angelic experiences or seen anything else? I have not had any other angelic experiences. I do personally, like not on a hospice nurse Julie level, but just on a Julie level <laughs> myself. Uh, you know, I've always been a seeker. I mean, even as a little girl, I don't know about you, but like I've always been asking like big existential questions. Even mm -hmm. as like a five-year-old, I would be like, what is God? Why are we here? <laughs> why are you my mom? Why, like, why was it just, I always have these really, really big questions. I'd always be talking to quote unquote, God, uh, I say quote unquote, cause I don't, I don't know what I was talking to, but even as a little girl, you know, I didn't grow up in a religious house household. So like those ideas came to me on my own. And I always felt like I was talking to something bigger. Um, so nothing, nothing really angelic, but I just feel like my whole life I've had experiences where I've been shown, um, like your last guest, I think Annie, uh, yeah. uh, would talk about like how we're all one. Like, I feel like I've been shown many times that like, it's about the present moment. It's about, we're all connected to all things. We are all literally a part of the same thing. We're all one. We are all one is the main message I always get. So maybe not an angelic being, but like the message is clear that like, it's all love. We're all one. And everything is okay, always, mm -hmm. always, especially in the here and now. 
um, yeah. yeah. Oh, I love that. Okay. So you said all the phenomenon that can happen. Now, these uh, listeners who listen to the show know that uh, we've had near-death experience folks on and, and they know that as people near their end of life um, are on hospice care, they can see loved ones on the other side. Like you said before, they can see pets. Pets, I believe, can be part of our spirit team. Um, are there other different phenomenons that happen as well? Uh, otherworldly divine happenings as we transition to the other side? Yeah, there's... Um... In chapter six in my book, which I just read yesterday, it's my longest chapter, this deathbed <laughs> phenomena, because there's so many things that can happen. I feel like they all kind of tie together. So the number one thing that I think this actually will surprise people, the number one phenomena that happens the most is terminal lucidity, which is the rally or the surge of energy. It happens in like almost one third of all of our patients, which is one in three. That's a lot of people. Uh, and a lot of people just kind of miss it because they don't know they don't know that it's happening. They don't know what it is. And that's when someone is looking very, very ill, looking close to death. And then suddenly they have like a really good day or a really good few hours or a really good couple days. Usually it's no more than a few days max. And then they die after. So it's like, that's, that's the, they don't linger on. They don't have a bunch of good days. They have, they're going down, down, downhill. And then suddenly phew, a burst of energy, they are almost like they're back to themselves again, you know, and people could think like, holy, is it, are they better? And then they die shortly after, I would say a couple days. So it can be, it can be a, the greatest gift if you know it's happening and you can be there with your loved one. It can be very devastating if you don't know what's happening. So we always try to educate. I always try to educate beforehand because there's nothing worse than being like the bearer of bad news when you're the hospice nurse and you're seeing it in real time and to be like, listen, I know this is an amazing day, but I'm trying to prepare you guys that this could mean that they're going to die shortly after. Yeah. Um, so I always try to educate beforehand so I don't have to be that person who's saying like, I know they're doing really well, but I think they're going to die. Um, so that's the first one. Then the second one we see a lot, like you already said, is the visioning where people see dead relatives, dead, dead loved ones, dead friends, pets, people see pets, people see angels, people see beautiful landscapes, they hear music, depending on their religion, they'll see, you know, if they're Christian, they see Jesus, um, different angels, it just depends. Um, this doesn't always happen. And I don't have a percentage of people who do this, but it happens often enough that we like to educate about it. Mm -hmm. and and uh pe people always think it's because of like lack of oxygen or they're on so many meds and it's just it's just not it's just not i am a clinical nurse who's been a nurse for 16 years i know what hallucinations look like i know what delirium looks like i know what icu psychosis looks like this is different these people are usually alert and oriented they're usually afraid to tell you because they're kind of like I don't want you to think I'm losing my, I don't want you to think I'm confused. It's just different. And it brings peace is the main thing. It brings peace and comfort to them. Now, the other ones kind of tie into visioning because there's something we call like the, I call it the death stare. I have no idea if that's the actual name. I call it the death stare or like the death reach. And that's when someone's kind of talking to you, talking to you, talking to you. And then suddenly they like veer off and they're in their own little world and they're staring into the corner. And no matter what you do to get their attention, you can't get their attention. They won't stop looking at the corner. And sometimes they'll even reach up during that time. Like they're reaching for somebody or something. And then sometimes they'll even vocalize mom or like, oh my gosh, what are you doing here? Like yeah. that, you know, something like that. So it can all, they can all kind of tie in together. I usually see the death reach and the, and the death stare when they are a little in and out of lucidity. They're not always, they're not always like alert and oriented during that time. That's usually closer to death when they are um, kind of like with you, but not with you or like in and out of sleep. Um, so that's something we see a lot. I've seen so many people stare into a corner and then get the biggest smile ever, mm -hmm. you know, and like they're seeing something or someone. 
Um, and then the last thing, uh, which are a few different ones that they all kind of tie in together are people like choosing when they die. Um, people can really like choose a day when they, not everybody, obviously, but I've seen people choose an exact day. I've seen people be like, I'm waiting until after my grandson's born. Um, or I'm waiting until everyone comes into the house and, and says their goodbyes, or I'm waiting until everyone leaves so I can die alone. Um, usually people who want to die alone are people who are really, um, ind independent, uh, maybe uh, shy, maybe introverted, also like prideful in the sense of like, they don't want everyone seeing them look like that. So they'll wait, they'll wait until um, everyone will leave the room finally, because no one wants to leave the room because they're trying to all be there for the person. And then finally, once everyone leaves the room, either to get coffee or go to the bathroom or whatever, then they'll die. And mm -hmm. so many family members are saddened by this or, oh my God, how could we let them die alone? And I always, I'm like, listen, they probably wanted it that way, especially if that's their personality anyway. Yeah. And then um, there's people who will wait, you know, if they're the matriarch or they know that uh, they'll wait until everyone. I've seen someone, I just shared the story again in my book um, of this woman who was 100 years old. She's 100. She had children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren. And she was the matriarch of the family and she was actively dying when I saw her, which means usually only a few days, maybe a week max, maybe, because you're not eating and drinking, you're fully unconscious. This woman who was 100 hung on for almost three weeks, actively dying, meaning like no food or water, not waking up until every one of her family members came in, like flew in to be with her. There was like 50 people in her house. Mm. And then she finally died. Mm. It's like, what? So people can, people can sometimes really hang on or choose when they're going to do this um, or kind of know, have a sense that they're going to go soon, you know? So who knows, Julie, but I've seen it enough to know that like, it's a thing that happens. Oh my gosh, of course. Well, it's so interesting because uh, I'll be in sessions and this happened from the very first session that I started doing um, where people will come in and they'll be like, my relative is transitioning, or I, I think that they're not going to be here that long. How long do they have? Like they want to know. And I said, what you don't understand is that this is like the hardest energy. And the angels talk about this all the time to work with because they show it to me like double dutch with the jump ropes that it's like the energy of the person is in it's out it's in it's out it's in it's out like and they also show me that every person human being has these roots of energy that kind of go down from our feet and ground us into our earthly personality, the roles that we have here. And in order to kind of transition through the dying process, not quickly, because some of us leave quickly, um, but through the passing away process, really use our will to lift those mm. roots up. And in a way, I don't think all of us do, but I think most of us do make peace with um, the life that we've lived. Do and you feel, oh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, no. but this is just making me think, I don't want to forget. Do you feel like, and you don't have to say yes, because even though, uh, 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 do you feel like people who have prepared for their death and kind of maybe not even accepted it, but at least talked about it, even if the talking is like, I don't want to, right? Yeah. Do you feel like people who have uh, prepare for it are able to let go of that energy more and those roots more or like does it feel does it seem like it's easier for them because I feel like that's what I see yeah but yeah I don't know yeah, that they've talked about it yeah and you see a lot of people I think that's one of the hardest energies to work with is what you just said there are a lot of people who don't want to go and mm -hmm. There's this energy of will. I want to write an entire book on this, but it's a force energy within you and you have it your entire life, this will. And towards the end of life, I think that's one of the last energies that we release um, and maybe why people get that that surge of energy, where which I think is really a gift. Um 
is how do you let go of your will that's been gas in the tank your entire Whoa, life girl. to propel you forward? Yeah. Talk about that's like, that's like in life and in death, how do you let go of your will? Cause like, it's so necessary. Sometimes I think about that. I mean, this is a whole nother podcast, but I'm, but I'm sober and I'm in a 12 step program that talks a lot about, you know, your will versus surrender versus letting go. And it's just like a, an onward daily thing that like you, that I personally need to practice sometimes. So just let go, let go, let go. I always say people die how they live, you know? And if you're meaning like, and not even in a negative way, but like meaning like if you're super independent, if you're really neurotic, if you're, you know, if you're controlling, like you might not have the easiest death because it's Mm -hmm. gonna be really hard for you to accept the help that you definitely will need. Everyone at the end of life needs to, accept help because you cannot do it anymore. Like you can't do the easiest things, get up to go to the bathroom. Have so, you know, so like people who are very independent and like don't want to rely on people, they have a really hard time with that. Uh, and I'm I saying this totally to myself too, because yeah. I, I'm like that. And like, if you, if you like to live in the black and white, dying is not black and white. Right? There's so much gray. There's so much not knowing. and it's really hard for human beings who like to know. I want to know. I want to, that's why everyone's always like, how much time do I have? <laughs> you yeah, know? Yeah. And like, and to be honest, I can, we can kind of as hospice nurses, we can kind of, the closer they are to death, the easier it is to kind of see that. But when you're six months away, which still isn't much time, but like, it's gray, it's a gray area. Mm-hmm. Like you just got to live it for today. And that's and I- so hard to do. It is. And I don't think that that's the right question. It's the question that everybody asks, you know, how much time do I have? But the question is, what am I supposed to be doing? Like, where is the roadmap for this? And is that where your book goes? Ah, truly, that's so great. Yes. What am I supposed to be doing? Yeah, my book is basically, you know, my book is not meant to be, it can be read from cover to cover, for sure. But my book is meant to be kind of like a roadmap, kind of like uh, an educational book to help you prepare for mm-hmm. end of life. And guess what? We're all dying. So who is mm-hmm. it for? It's for everyone. It truly is. Um, because it's never too early. Like we plan for everything, weddings, birth, jobs, moving. We plan for everything. Why do we not plan for the thing that is guaranteed, which is death? And just so it's not like a textbook and boring, I added in stories of my life and think cool things that have happened and different, you know, different patients that have really changed my life and things like that. So it's like a, it's like a educational book with stories woven in. So it doesn't feel like a straight textbook. And Mm -hmm. um, it's meant to be kind of like, just pick the chapter you think sounds good for you in the moment and read it. And hopefully you get something from it. So you can, um, because I think, I think the more we, you know, the more we contemplate our own mortality, the better we will live. And then the more peaceful we will die. Because it's about living, really. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it's also just about understanding how to make peace too with um, letting go of other relationships. I mean, Years before I started the podcast and lost my dad, um, I lost my grandfather, who I was extremely close to, to cancer. And my grandma, and I don't know if it was my grandfather's request, but my grandma just definitely didn't want anybody there. Like she wanted it to be private. She didn't want anybody to see him in a weakened state. She wanted everybody to remember him powerful. And so the last conversation that I had with him I wasn't prepared, like, and I Mm -hmm. think I would have bypassed her wishes and just hopped on a plane if I knew that it was the end, but he had been struggling with cancer off and on where it went into remission. So this was years and years and years. And they're like, he's sick again. He's in hospice. Okay. You know that that's bad, but we didn't understand. So I'm on the phone with him and He's just talking about stuff and like not tracking with a conversation. Like he's just Mm -hmm. totally in left field talking about base uh, basketball and the bulls, which he and I used to watch all the time together. But 
it wasn't basketball season. There were, you know, like he just wasn't there. And I left the conversation thinking that was the oddest conversation that I've had with him. Nobody mm-hmm. said he's actively passing away. And so yeah. it was just a confusing parting. Yeah. You don't know what you don't know. And most people yeah. don't know because yeah. no one talks about it. No one educates you. Even, you know, I'm even guilty. Um, you know, like I never want to push blame on anyone. Right. But just in our culture, I am trying to change and me and other people, million, tons of other people too, but I am trying to change the way we look at death and dying. Cause in our culture, it's just not talked about. Even as an ICU nurse, when I was an ICU nurse, I did not know what actively dying looked like. I didn't know. I don't see it. I didn't know facts about it. I didn't know the biology of dying. And I think that goes for most people. So when you don't know, you 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 don't know, right? And you just have weird conversations and you're not understanding what's going on, right? And then you interpret that through grief, through the lens of grief and loss. And it can be... Um, really, really, I don't know, traumatizing. Is that the right word? I don't know, but it can really stick with you in a negative way. And that's what I want to try to change because I think even as healthcare workers, we need to do a better job at understanding that people don't know what's going on. So we got to, we have to be the ones to say, this is what I'm seeing. And now that you know that you can better choose. I don't care what you choose to do, but you can better choose what you should do. Do you get on the plane to go see him? Do you, um, I mean, of course you have to respect your grandmother's things, but like, you know, people can just better choose when they really know what's going on. And I think we're all just so scared to say it. But from what I Mm -hmm. found is people always think hospice nursing is, is depressing. What I have found is when people who are dying in their families find one person who is willing to say things like that, like you're dying, here's what you can expect. There's not a look of horror on their face. There is a look of relief. I mean, I'm telling you nine times out of 10, every once in a while, you can tell people have not been prepared or they didn't know, or they're not ready every once in a while. But most of the time people look relieved. And by the time I leave there, they're like, thank you. Thank you. Someone was willing to talk to us. And I'm getting chills right now because it's like, um, yeah, so it's not depressing. I leave there being like, wow, that was great. I connected with another human soul and and others, their families. And um, I really helped people. That felt good. You know, it doesn't feel as depressing. Yeah, I'll tell you what that looks like in my work is a lot of people will say, I'm going through this with my mom, I'm going through this with my dad, or I'm going through this with my grandparent. And we talk about things, but we can't talk about it with X, Y, or Z person in the family because they don't want to hear about it. They don't want to talk about it. And, and so I, I think that some conversations are being had, but I also think that people are very protective around not maybe crossing other people's boundaries or making them feel uncomfortable. And, um, but I just see a world, you know, not even 20 years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, where this is going to look a lot different. Yeah, I hope so. I yeah, hope so. Me too. Yeah. It does seem like, I can't tell if it's like I, I have a bias now because now I'm kind of in this world of meeting other people who are willing to talk about it. So it feels like, oh, something's happening. There's like a movement going where like, there's a lot of us now out here and people are wanting to listen and wanting to learn. So I hope that is the reality of it. You know, I can't tell if it's like, I'm just yelling into a until a vacuum. They, you know, when you, you like, the more you look for it, the more you see it. But it does seem like, you know, like I didn't set out on TikTok to like get a bunch of followers on TikTok. I was, I'm 40. Like, I don't even know. Like I was on TikTok because my nieces were, right? But four videos in, I gained tons, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of followers and it just hasn't stopped. So like people are willing and wanting to get the information. And that surprised me, you know? So maybe, maybe we are ready. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So tell us some amazing stories of visioning where at the end of life, um, they do, you know, your clients do 
see things or reach out or feel at peace because their loved ones are coming to visit yeah. them and, and get them. So I'd like to, I like to preface it with this. Visioning happens so often and, and like people tell me about it so much that it's even hard for a story to like stick out because mm. it's like, it's so commonplace Yeah. because n- now that I educate families about it, um, almost, I would like, like I'd said, maybe eight times out of 10 families will go, oh, that's already happening. Oh, he's already talked about seeing his, seeing my mom, his wife, who's been dead for five years, you know, but I'll tell a couple that are, that are really good, that really stand out to me. So, um, I got called to a patient's house. This is how it normally goes. I got called to a patient's house because the patient is experiencing some confusion and the family's concerned. I go to the house. The patient is not confused at all. Very pleasant, very nice. Like, in the, and of course the family's like, of course, when you're here, he's fine, you know, but when you're gone, he's, he's confused and he's saying some things and they're kind of like whispering it to me, like out in the hallway, like not really addressing it to him. But we're all together in the room and he's being fine and saying nothing's wrong. And he's alert and oriented saying his birth date, birth date and like all the things I ask, you know, who's the president, stuff like that. And then the family leaves real quick and I go to leave and he grabs my arm and he's like, hey, <laughs> hey, I saw my parents last night. My parents came to me. They said, they're not coming to get me yet, but they're going to um, and not to worry. And they're going to, they'll take care of me. And I was like, that's amazing. How do you feel? And he was like, I feel so like, oh, what did he say? He said, I used to feel so afraid. And now I don't. My family mm-hmm. thinks I'm crazy. But and actually, he was like, my family thinks I'm crazy. And maybe I am. <laughs> like, like, because he was kind of looking at me like, hey, like whispering, like, what's going on? You know? And I was yeah. like, and he's like, but I, but I know I, but I know I feel, um, but I know I feel comforted now. And I was like, that's all that matters. And this is really, and of course I just say, this is really normal. That happens all the time. And I'm like, listen, I don't know why it happens. We don't know why it happens, but I can tell you it happens. And all I know is if you feel comforted by it and you um, feel less afraid now, go for it. And if they keep coming to you, amazing. You know, and he was like, and then he just sort of was like, yeah, it, it's, it's very, um, it doesn't feel at the moment as like, um, again, for lack of better words, mystical as it sounds, it's very matter sure. of fact in the moment. Like when I'm talking to them, especially being the nurse, you know, I'm not going to be like, I'm not going to go into like what it could mean, or I, I treat it very like a symptom of death and dying, you know, and I just sort of say like, it's very normal. I'm so glad that you feel comforted now. If they keep coming to you, go for it. You know, it's okay. So then we say our goodbyes. I leave. I talk to the family. And of course, they're grabbing my arm. Listen, last night, he's saying he's seeing his parents. I don't know what's going on. He's confused. He seems okay now. But but we need to do something about it. You know what I mean? Like, we need need medication. Get rid of these symptoms. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. We need medication here. So when he's saying this stuff, we can give it to him. You know what I mean? (laughs) And it's like, I didn't share what what he's, you know, I don't want to like share what he's saying to me. Right. So I just said, it's okay. Like, it's okay. This is is totally normal. And again, I kind of take the nurse's scientific stance on it when I'm talking to them. Like, this is just something we see. We don't know why we see it. We call it visioning. We see it across all nations across all culture cultures it's like a worldwide thing that happens to people who are dying and we just go with it especially if he's comforted by it does he seem agitated and and scared or anything when this is happening no you know they're they're kind of like this family in particular was kind of like annoyed like they were like no but he's saying he's seeing dead people you know and I'm like I know I know it's okay like I can't help but like kind of smile we eventually kind of all laughed about it I'm like I know it's okay this happens all the time and as long as he's not agitated by it and he's comforted by it we're gonna go with it just go with it and they're kind of like okay you know and that is that's just one story, but that's kind of like the gist of it at, at all times. Most people are concerned, family members are concerned. 
they're saying he's seeing my mom. She's been dead forever. You know, like what's going on? And then the family member who's sort of like, I'm saying, I'm telling you, I'm seeing my wife. She's right here. It, even in the room sometimes, like we'll be in the room and they'll be like, I see her right here. She's right here, you know? Um, yes. And kind, and the, most of them know that they're dead. So most of them know it's strange that they're seeing a dead person. You know, that's how, that's how alert and oriented they are. It's not always like that. Sometimes if people have dementia or something, they'll be like, um, they'll just be talking to somebody and you'll be like, who are you talking to? And they'll be like, Marcy, da, 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 you know, and like Marcy is their sister who died two years ago. So it can be something like that. But most of the time it's like someone's alert and oriented and, and just as, just as kind of confused about it as we are. I had another great time that just happened recently where um, I saw a man who, who was, who did have dementia and was mostly nonverbal just very pleasant, like pleasantly confused, just always smiling. And I was really happy. And I walked in and he was smiling at me and um, kind of making eye contact with me. And all of a sudden I, I was just sort of talking to him. He wasn't talking back, but I was just talking about everyday stuff. And then all of a sudden he looked away and started looking somewhere else and I couldn't get his attention again. And he was smiling and he kept doing that as our conversation went on, which usually tells me they're close-ish to death. You know, like they're getting in towards like a transitioning phase. So I brought his wife in who was elderly and this caregiver just so I could show her like what was happening. So I could be like, do you see what's happening here? This shows me like he might be closer to death or, you know, just, just kind of preparing her. And she was like, oh, honey, <laughs> this is like old. This is like nothing to her. She was like, oh, oh, he's been doing this for weeks. And, you know, he tells me what he sees sometimes. And I'm like, really? What does he see? And she goes, he sees Jesus. He tells me he's seeing Jesus. And I'm like, that's amazing. And she's like, it is. He's so comforted. I'm so comforted. It's amazing. And then she takes me out of the room and she uh, is like, and he's, he's doing his own thing. He's happy in there, whatever. She takes me out of the room and she's like, you're not going to believe this. But a few weeks ago, my sister died and we were all really close, all three of us. And um, I didn't tell him one, because he has, de- just because he has dementia and like, he's not really going to remember. And like, I just didn't, it's like, why keep having to retell him over and over again that someone so died? So I just didn't tell him, right? But after a while, I felt bad that I'd never told him. So um, I went to, I, so I went in there one day and he doesn't really talk. So it's like, not like he can really be verbal. He can kind of say like, yes and no and stuff, but he's not really having conversation. And she goes, but the other day I felt bad. So I went in there and, and I kind of, you know, like sat down and said, you know, so-and-so, I need to tell you something um so and so died I'm sorry I didn't tell you uh and she wasn't expecting him to answer and all of a sudden he goes oh I I already know and of Mm -hmm. course she's just shocked that he's even talking and then Mm -hmm. shocked that like he already knows and she was like what how do you know and she kind of got mad being like who told you you know because she told everyone not to tell him so she's like what how do you know who told you and he goes she did Mm -hmm. One, he's talking. That's amazing. I have chills just thinking about that. She did. She came to me and told me she died. Wow. What? Like that kind of stuff is, that's not really visioning per se, but kind you know, that she, he visioned that she was there and she told him that she had died. It's like, wow. I mean, there's so many miracles there. One that he could, one that he was even verbally able to say that to her. And then two that he already knew and who told you she did, you know, it's just like, that's the kind of stuff. That's that it. happens to me at my job, you know? Yeah. And I, I left there being like, wow, I love my job. Thank you for sharing this with me, you know? So do you ever have it? I have a percentage of people who say that their loved ones at the end of life talk about not only their loved ones coming to get them, but that they have to get ready for their party. They have to go to their party. I definitely have people. I, I, I'm sure I've had people say I have to get ready for my party. I just don't remember because that's how often it. That's how often things like this happen. It's like you kind of almost get lost in the things, the cool things that, that happen. Um, but I definitely have people talk about you know getting ready to go, going on a trip. Um, I hear that more than party, going on a trip. I have to get ready. I'm going on a trip. Um, so much so that families have to be like, we can't keep them in bed because they keep trying to like pack, 
<laughs> and get up and yeah. put their shoes on. And yes. um, yeah, so I hear that. I hear that a lot too. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. And I think that what happens too, just so that people are clear is that um, what spirit says is that if you're Muslim, you're going to see figures from that religion. If you're Christian, yeah. you're going to see figures from that religion. Do you see that too, that, um, you know, spirit always goes, listen, if Muhammad showed up for a Christian person, they'd be like, oh my God, was I wrong? You know, like, and vice versa. Um, exactly. but, uh, but it, it's not about like all religions are one. Um, it's just that, it is comforting. And so the other side knows that and they're able to use that to bring comfort to folks at the end. Exactly. Yeah. That's what, that's, that's what I think too. Like that's been my experience. People who are uh, a certain, like that, that man who said he saw Jesus, very devout Christian, right? So other people, um, other people have seen other deities depending on what their religion is. And some people um, like, and even people who are devout atheists and don't believe in anything, Sometimes they see, sometimes they're not just not seeing anything. Sometimes they do too. There's people who vision and see dead relatives, dead loved ones, and they don't even believe in that stuff, right? So um, from my experience, um, it's all, it's just, it's comforting for the person who's experiencing it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think it just brings comfort. That's the whole point. Amazing. I have gotten yeah. this vision the entire time that we've been talking. Um that like being at the end of life is kind of like having those best days ever. You know, you're on vacation, you have the best day of your life. And have you ever been on the beach watching a sunset and you think to yourself, I just don't want this day to end. Like I just yeah. want it to keep going. Um, that's what the energy feels like to me. Yeah. I love that. I feel like um, I always describe it as um, like seeing so many people take their last breath because the grief for me is removed because it's not my mom, you know, and uh, it's like I can feel it feel like the energy in the room is different and the energy feels like how it feels when I watch someone, which I haven't watched many, but when I when I've seen like births or like a baby being freshly born you're kind of, you're like whoa like the energy is just like whoa this now this thing is here and like you can't help not this thing this baby a human yeah. <laughs> you can't help but like <laughs> weep right you can't help but weep that like what the hell just happened you know that is the same energy that I feel when I see someone take their last breath there is wow. sadness in the room and stuff too because of the grief but mostly it feels like sacred and like time stands still like that really expansive mm -hmm. feeling of everything you know and to me it feels like I always feel like the reason why I don't fear death is because to me I know that it's I'm going to a place that feels more like home than mm -hmm. here ever has and oh, I've always yeah. felt even when I was a little girl I've always felt homesick makes me want to cry I because I because I still feel the homesickness homesick for a place that I have forgotten but once I'm there again which I will be I'm gonna be like oh it's he it's you it's here it's, it's it this is it I've always known this you know this is where I've always belonged Yes. I'm going to send you a copy of my book. So, um, the entire time I was like, can I bring through messages to her? Can I not? Um, <laughs> uh, the entire time the seraphim angels have been with you. And that's the one thing that they keep saying is that you were tapped and asked to come to this lifetime. You didn't raise your hand and volunteer on the other side. And so I talk in my book about how this experience of life is different for those of us who are tapped and asked to come. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So I'll get your address. That makes after me want to cry. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. that's what that I is. always have. Even as a little girl, I've always felt like homesick for a yeah. place that I don't remember. Yeah. But I me know too. it's real. Me too. And I feel uh, there's a lot of people who feel the same way, but I believe that that's what that is. Joey, yeah. thank you. Yeah. yeah. It feels so nice to like be understood. Yeah. Yes. 
Julie, your book is amazing. Nothing to fear, demystifying death uh, to live more fully. Julie McFadden, we'll put the link in the show notes to this, but where can people find you on Instagram and online? And TikTok. Yeah, so- yeah, so I know, right? If you don't go, if you don't want to go on TikTok, I don't blame you. Um, <laughs> no, but I'm basically hospice nurse Julie across all all social media. So Facebook, Instagram, uh, TikTok, and then my favorite is YouTube. So YouTube is my most like highly produced show, and I go live at five every Wednesday. I have long videos, so YouTube is my favorite. Um, and if you really want to like dig into the information, YouTube is probably where it's at. But Hospice Nurse Julie, um, just anywhere, well, you can find me. Amazing. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. So great. Great interview. I really appreciate it. Friends, I need your help reaching as many people as possible. If you'd like to support this podcast and help us spread more hope to the world, please book a session with me. Join my angel membership or take my angel Reiki school. What's the difference? If you'd like to know what messages your angels and loved ones have for you, you'll want to book a session with me. The angel membership is all about your own personal spiritual healing. The membership takes you on a spiritual journey that teaches you how to create your own heaven on earth. And the angel Reiki school is for those who want to get certified in mediumship angel messages, and energy healing all at once. These are three ways you can help us share a message of hope and love with more people than ever before. Register for one or all three at theangelmedium.com. That's theangelmedium.com. Now, let's pray together. As we do, I want you to pray in a way where you feel as though everything you want for yourself and the world has already come true and you're giving thanks. Why? Because this is the best way to manifest. So let's begin. God, universe, source, thank you. We're so grateful that you've blessed this world with calm and peace for all. This calm and peace has spread like ripples, soothing the hearts of every soul. Thank you for opening our hearts to abundance, allowing each of us to live our most authentic life and helping us to create our own heaven on earth. We thank you for the love and deep heart-to-heart -heart connection that surrounds us every day in our relationships. We thank you for the abundance of health and aliveness we feel radiating from every cell in our and our family's bodies. Thank you for the gift of walking this life with us and guiding us every step of the way through your messages. We hear you through our own intuition and we feel you walking right by our sides and we overflow with gratitude. Thank you for financial abundance and abundance of opportunities and miracles, blessings and prosperity in every way. We know that you want us to succeed so that we can show others how you want them to succeed too. Thank you for the boundless love, kindness, empathy, and compassion that binds us all together. Thank you for the laughter, fun, moments of pure delight that fill us every day, especially today. God, Universe Source, thank you for blessing us beyond measure and allowing us to use our souls, gifts, talents, skills, and abilities to serve the world. We love you. I love you. And in this we pray. Amen. Friends, we're working on some pretty major things over here. And if you wouldn't mind saying a little prayer that these Things come to fruition if they're God's will. We'd so appreciate it. And please add a little prayer in for any specific thing you need right now too. Have a beautiful, blessed day. And don't forget to submit your contact info at theangelmedium.com if you'd like me to channel the name of one of your angels for you. Sending you peace, bliss, and many blessings.